Good morning. For those of you that don't know who I am, I am Linda Qualls, and I would like to welcome you to my home this morning for another Sunday School Hour of Study in the Book of Romans. I hope everyone is ready to get your praise and your worship on, and I hope most of you are able to go to our 1030 service at church today with Brother Matt. Since I'm in the high-risk category of old age, <laughs> I've decided I'm going to stay home and watch it online. And hopefully, we'll get to return to the church soon because I miss my church family and uh, looking forward to being able to come back soon. So before we start our lesson this morning, I always like to start off with a prayer, and uh, if you would, bow with me now, and we'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so thankful to you for another Sunday morning, Lord, and for the all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you'll forgive us where we fail you and help us, Lord, to be better Christians and better witnesses. Lord, we pray for those this morning that are sick and suffering, Lord. So many people are sick right now, Lord, and just ask you to, to be with them, Lord. Give them peace and comfort and strength to endure your will. And if it be your will, Lord, we ask that you would lay your healing hand upon them. And Lord, we pray for the spiritually sick this morning, Lord, those that need our prayers the most, Lord, those that are lost and undone and headed for a devil's hell. Lord, we just ask you in the name of Jesus to have mercy on them and bless them, Lord, with and open their hearts and minds to the truth and convict their hearts, Lord, so that they can, can come to know you as their Savior before it's too late. Lord, I just ask you to be with me now as I conduct this Sunday school class. Lord, let my words be your words, Lord. We love you and we praise you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title of our lesson today is Accepting. And it said believers accept and encourage other believers to make unity easier to acquire. In understanding the context of our lesson today, it says we are called to be living sacrifices to use our gifts to bring God glory and to build up the church. In Romans chapter 12, it says, We are all parts of Christ's body, and each of us has different work to do. And since we are all one body in Christ, we belong to each other and we need each other. We are no longer existing to only please ourselves. We live in relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should also demonstrate the reality of the gospel by our attitudes toward authority, including government officials, with whom we may disagree. While we may need to choose between God's laws and human laws, in the most extreme cases, those officials deserve our respect. The fact rebelling against our laws and leaders is the same as rebelling against God who placed those himself. It said, Paul called on the Romans to demonstrate unity within the church body. Instead of judging others, Christians should protect one another. When disagreements arise, 
They should use the law of liberty and the law of love as guides for their attitudes and behaviors. Christians have a responsibility to encourage others even if it means putting their own desires on the back burner. This honors God and points the watching world toward Christ. In other words, that's our witness. And that should be our main goal, is to live our lives that does point people to Christ. And this brings us to our scripture for today, which is in chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. And I encourage you, if you don't have a book, a Sunday school book, to, to get your Bible and follow along with the scripture. And <clears throat> I'll be reading the ver uh, verses 1 through 4 right now, and we'll discuss it, and then we'll go on and read the rest of it later and talk about it. I'm going to read verse 1 through 3 which is entitled, Stop Judging. It says, it says, Accept anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may be eating anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat. And one who does not eat must not judge one who does, because God has accept, accepted him. Who are you to judge another's household servant? Before his own Lord he stands or falls, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. In verse 1 through 3, Paul was encouraging the Romans to accept anyone who is weak in faith. Another way to say it is to welcome or receive the weak into the fellowship. And don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. These arguments only create fractures in the church and distract it from fulfilling the commission given by Jesus. To illustrate his point, Paul provided what was likely a real-life example in the Roman congregation. Christians from a Gentile background had embraced their spiritual liberty and were able to eat anything with a clear conscience. But the weak believers, likely those from a Jew Jewish heritage, struggled with their new freedom because they still worried about consuming food the law considered unclean. So they would only eat vegetables. The problem was not so much their food preferences but their attitudes. The weaker Christians sometimes felt superior and would judge those who ate anything. Likewise, those who ate freely tended to look down on those who abstained. Neither position was correct. Christians have a responsibility to love each other, not belittle or, or judge one another over matters of conscience. And finally, in verse 4, it said, Paul noted that every believer is a servant of God. Each servant stands or falls based on his or her master's standard, not some standard created by fellow servants. Ultimately, everyone, including Christians, will give an account for their actions. But we won't be answering to one another. We will answer to the Lord for what we have done or haven't done. We need to focus on being transformed into his likeness 
and spend less time trying to mold everyone else into our likeness. And that made me think about, uh, I think it was 2008 when they came out with that, and I'm sure many of you have seen those bracelets that says, I am second. It has become a platform for Christians evangelism, realizing that we are second is a good way to acquire the mental attitude of putting our own desires on the back burner and putting others first. It truly honors God and strengthens our witness. And that's a, a good idea to have one of those bands to wear and it, to say I am second, it would, it would remind us that we are second, that it's not about us. It's not always about us. It's about putting others first. And most of all, putting God first in our lives. Our, in our book here, it asks the question, what are some issues that stir debates in the church today? Well, when I get to thinking about that, you think about there are several issues that can cause debate in the church. But the one that I that brought that came to my mind was the worship music and how that that some in the church, preferably the young, likes the contemporary music, and then you've got your older ones in the church that prefer the old hymns, and a lot of times that divides churches. But you know, I, I grew up on the old hymns, of course, and I was that's what I was used to. And when I was first introduced to the contemporary music, I didn't think I liked it that, <laughs> that much because it was different. I, it takes me a while to get used to change. But you know what? After I uh, sang sang them several times, I got to where I liked it. I like the contemporary music. I like I like all music, and I think James does a good job in our church uh, incorporating the contemporary and the old hymns. And I think that gives everybody a little of something of what they like, and it causes for harmony. And when you got harmony in the church. That is when you're going to really uh, grow as a church and be able to truly worship in the frame of mind that we should worship, and that is uh, in unity with our whole church family. And also, uh, like I said, we should remember that it's not all about us and our preferences. Okay, on that note, we're going to go to our second set of scripture, which is entitled, Honor God, and it says, and this is verses 5 through 8, it says, One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes the day observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, and whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord, that he does not eat it. And he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. In verse 5 and 6, in addition to questions about food, there were also divisions in Rome over holy days. Some members observed some days as more important than others. Most likely, Jews in Rome were observing the Sabbath along with the important feast days. 
others in the church considered every day to be the same. This group did not feel any obligation to a religious calendar and saw no need to consecrate certain days. Again, Paul called both groups to carefully examine their motives and convictions. The question of days was not the point. Not everyone had to believe the same thing on this matter, but everyone had a responsibility to honor God with a clear conscience. Paul did not condemn those who observed certain days as holy days, as long as they did so as an act of worship. Likewise, he refused to chastise anyone over food preferences if they were seeking to honor God. God's church is big enough to include people who differ on negotiable practices. We don't have that uh, in our church today. I don't think we worry so much about what one another eats <laughs> or, or, or a lot of things like that. The main thing is that we honor God in everything that we do. And we know what's right and what's wrong. And God convicts us, too, on what's right and what's wrong. Uh said for Paul's for Paul God's glory was the primary motivation for the Christian life he challenged the Corinthians to filter their actions through the test of God's glory and in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 it says whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do you must do it all for the glory of God And moving on to verse 7 and 8, no one who has accepted Jesus as Savior claims to be a child of God lives for himself and no one dies for himself. Once we surrender our lives to him, we give up control. Our salvation means we died to our old lives of sin and were raised with Christ. Every believer now lives and dies for the Lord. To put it another way, we belong to the Lord. Paul had already explained to the Romans that all people are born into sin and have no ability to please God in their own strength. Thankfully, Christ paid a price so that we could not pay. But his death also demands that we live to honor God. One way to do that in practical terms is to recognize the sincere efforts of others who are also striving to please God, although different ways. We can enjoy freedom to serve God as He leads us, but we must also allow others the same privilege. Our rights do not extend so far as to trample the convictions of others. And moving on over to our last set of scriptures, which is entitled Remove Obstacles. In verses 9 through 12 says, Christ died and returned to life for this, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Are you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Jesus' death and resurrection unifies believers. He lived a perfect life, life, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and has authority over all things, both dead and living. His authority has no boundaries. Because he is Lord of all, he is also judge of all. We're not. 
And uh, in verse 10, Paul asked two rhetorical questions. First, he asked why a weaker believer would judge your brother or sister. And second, he asked why a stronger Christian would despise your brother or sister. In truth, neither judgment nor contempt is appropriate in the body of Christ. Both groups were in the wrong. More important, Paul reminded them that one day each of them would stand before the judgment seat of God. This will not be a judgment of salvation, but of works. An evaluation of how we used the life God has given us. And in verse 11, Paul rooted his argument in the Old Testament, quoting Isaiah 45, 23. He reminded his readers that God said that every knee will bow before him, and eventually every tongue will give praise to God. This was a reminder to believers that he is Lord and ultimate judge over everyone and everything. And finally, in verse 12, again, Paul stated that our appearance before Jesus was not about praising him. It will also include being judged by him. Each of us will be called before God to give an account of ourselves. No one will be exempt. We will each answer to God for our actions and decisions. The Lord will serve as our judge. Because of this, we should be managing our own lives for His glory. Let us also be supporting and encouraging other believers in their desire to live for His glory. And that concludes our lesson for today. It's my prayer that we all receive what we needed to be better church members by avoid being judgmental toward other believers, spiritual understanding, and religious practices. To honor God regardless of what doing so may require. And to express understanding toward other believers and their God-honoring practices. And as I said earlier, I hope everyone was able to receive something from this lesson to help you in your spiritual walk and to remind us that as church members, as I said earlier, it's, it's not about us. It's, a, it's putting others ahead of ourselves and most of all putting God ahead of ourselves and trying to live our lives that's pleasing to Him. I hope uh, you all have a good rest of the week. And we'll end now in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so thankful to you for all your blessings and thankful to you that we have the opportunity and the privilege to come and to worship you, Lord. Lord, you are so good to us, and we're so thankful to you. Again, we continue to pray for the sick, Lord, that you bless them according to your will. And for the lost, Lord, that, that you would have mercy on them and that they would come to know you as their Savior before it's too late. And Lord, we pray for those that have strayed away, those Christians that have, have strayed away from you for whatever reason, Lord, that you would convict their hearts and have mercy on them by restoring the joy of their salvation and, Lord, that they would return to you. Lord, again, I ask you to forgive me where I fail you. Uh, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.